In the last episode, the initial Japanese invasion of the Korean peninsula pushed far past the shore to seize the Korean capital and sweep any and all Korean resistance out of the way. Yet so far, their efforts to topple the Korean government had all been in vain as the Korean military continued to fight on, desperately on land and victoriously at sea. But now, with Japan nearing the northern border, it is only a matter of time before the inevitable intervention of China. By midsummer of 1592, the vanguard Japanese division under Konishi Yukinaga, who had linked up with Kurora Nagamasa, were now pushing up with around 30,000 troops towards Pyongyang, in hot pursuit of the Korean king Sonjo, who had been fleeing north away from the incoming tide of samurai forces. With Pyongyang being essentially the final significant Korean city between the Japanese army and the Chinese border, many of the Japanese commanders hoped that with its fall, and with any luck the capture of the Korean King Sonjo, the Joseon government would collapse, and Japanese forces would be free to commence their full invasion of China. But unfortunately for Yukinaga and Nagamasa, the advance on Pyongyang would not be a swift endeavor, as their forces would soon become halted by the Taedong River, after a Korean army of 10,000 soldiers, which although were unable to halt the Japanese, were successful in destroying most of the rafts and boats the Japanese were going to use to make the crossing. Thus, the samurai were now stalled once again in a similar way to how Kato Kiyomasa had been held up at the Imjin River, Unable to quickly find a way to cross, Japanese soldiers would briefly encamp upon the south bank. It appears, however, that the Korean army had not learned from their past failure when they commenced a night raid soon across the river to try to rout the Japanese force. And although the surprise assault did prove to be initially successful, eventually the overwhelming number of Japanese soldiers fell upon the Korean army and caused a frantic retreat back across the Taedong. It was here that samurai commanders observed the routes at which Korean forces fled, noting important points along the river that proved to be shallow enough to ford. With this discovery, Yukinaga and Nagamasa's army was soon back on the march, crossing over the river and charging towards Pyongyang. Once again, Korean forces were left with no choice other than to abandon the city and flee further into hiding. In their departure, they made sure to destroy much of the heavy weaponry that they could not bring with them, sinking their heavy cannons into nearby bodies of water. But while they were able to deprive Japan from seizing new artillery, they completely neglected to destroy stockpiles of food stores that were left within the city, only to be found by the Japanese as they entered Pyongyang. But while in the west Pyongyang had fallen, in the east, Kato Kiyomasa, who was leading a significant vanguard division of his own, was driving his 20,000-man army onto what would become a famous expedition into the far north. This territory to the northeast was considered by most to be the wildest area of Korea, but it was one that needed to be seized to cover the eastern flank of Korea's border in preparation for the invasion into China. But even more importantly, specifically when it came to Kiyomasa, was the glory that could be won in such an ambitious campaign. Forcing his way east, Kiyomasa's army would begin seizing a number of Korean fortifications and seizing the provincial capital of Amgyong province. Following this, he left behind a token force to garrison the area before leading the remainder of his men northward along the coast. While to the south, an army under the command of the famous Shimazu leader, Shimazu Yoshihiro, moved to secure the remaining countryside, taking a number of strongholds before eventually turning inward to establish himself at Wonju, the provincial capital of the central province of Gangwon. But while the south was being tied down, Kiyomasa pushed deeper north until finally his forces would be met with some difficulty when they were confronted in battle by Hamyong's remaining provincial army. 
they would initially clash in open terrain that favored Korean cavalry tactics, bottling Kiyomasa's forces up and causing them to retreat to a nearby grain storehouse, where they took defensive position and managed to use their matchlocks to hold off wave after wave of Korean assault. After the Koreans eventually withdrew for the night, Kiyomasa quietly led his men out of the area of the grain storehouse and into positions around the Korean encampment, which was located in a swamp. Springing his ambush, Kiyomasa's soldiers gunned down the remainder of the Hamyong army as their bodies sunk into the murky waters below. Following this victory, Kiyomasa was able to finish the subjugation of the province using the same brutal tactics of subjugation that had made the Japanese occupation one of great cruelty thus far. But interestingly enough, there would also be a sizable portion of the local Koreans who would decide to defect to the Japanese, offering tribute and joining the occupation force in aims to save their lives and homes. Through them, he was handed over two of Korea's princes after the capture of Horyong, a Korean penal colony on the Tumen River. Important hostages that could be used for negotiations ahead. But now, Kyumasa was reaching the furthest north he could possibly go while still being in Korea. Any further and he'd be crossing the border into the Jurchen lands of Manchuria. However, Kiyomasa was bolstered by the success he had found so far, and wishing to not only seize the renown of being the first Japanese general to cross the border, but also wanting to set an example as a model dutiful samurai, he would ultimately choose to sally forth and cross into the unknown. With a sizable army at his back, built up of mostly Japanese soldiers but also many of the Korean defectors, Kiyomasa briefly left Korea behind and marched into Manchuria the farthest any samurai leader would ever go during the entire conflict. Yet quickly, after crossing the border, he and his forces would be set upon by a defending Jurchen army. And after a hard-fought engagement, and realizing that the effort would be fruitless so far from Japanese territory, he would be forced to eventually call for a withdrawal back into the safety of occupied Korea. Nevertheless, Kiyomasa's accomplishments, ambition, and fury during his northern warpath have all been said to be the crowning achievement of his military career. In a matter of three months, the Japanese invasion of Korea had succeeded in nearly every facet except one. Korea, although mostly seized by Japan, still fought on. On land through bitter determination and guerrilla warfare and at sea, victoriously by superior skilled admirals such as Yi Sun Shin, who I talked much about in the previous video. It was this spirit to continue the fight that would in the end be probably the most deciding factor in the reckoning that was to come for Japan. Had Korea capitulated now or earlier, samurai armies under the command of Toyotomi Hideyoshi would be pressing directly into China. Although with the current state of affairs, with Korea still fighting in a desperate war all across the peninsula, the Japanese could not hope to simply move on yet. On top of that, the situation at sea was becoming more and more apparent. It was clear to almost all Japanese commanders now that the Korean Navy held the upper hand, and there was little Japan could do other than resort to defensive tactics in aims to preserve their ships. But the largest consequence for the Japanese situation at sea would be the raided supply lines between Japan and Korea. If Japan was to succeed on land, they required a fresh stream of supplies and reinforcements to help hold down the lands they had occupied and continue their conquests. Although, as things stood now, the supply lines were becoming severely strained, and many samurai leaders in Korea began to fear for the shortages that were arising. There was also the imminent threat of China. Having neared the Chinese border, there was the potential threat that China may feel threatened enough by the Japanese to cross over and aid Joseon Korea. Luckily, up until this point, China had not been able to respond, facing internal problems of their own, tying up their military and preventing them from sending much needed aid to their Korean allies. And even then, with the speed at which Japan was able to push up into Korea, Chinese leaders were caught off guard, not ever suspecting Japan to be so powerful. Many, in fact, began to believe that much of Korea had simply defected to join Japan, rather than believe that the Japanese military was truly so strong. Finally, by August, China was able to send a small bit of aid to Korea in the form of a 3,000-man army. Marching south to Pyongyang, they initially found the city to be deserted, 
The appearance of the Chinese army had caught Yukinaga's forces by surprise, and thus many of them quickly ducked into hiding while the Chinese were allowed to enter beyond the walls. However, once the Chinese army moved deep enough into the city, Yukinaga sprung the trap and ordered his forces to come out of hiding, ambushing the enemy and destroying them. But this was not seen as an auspicious victory. Instead, it was viewed as an impending storm, as Japanese commanders began to realize that China was at last entering into the conflict. There was no looking down upon China by the Japanese, as many samurai commanders are said to have held a solid respect for Chinese commanders and fully appreciated the size and scale of the Chinese military force. If Korea had fallen and the Japanese supply lines secure, Perhaps then, Japan could have been able to take on the mighty beast that was Ming China. But now, with a war still raging across the Korean peninsula, and a lack of incoming supplies and reinforcements, the situation looked bleak. In January of 1593, China finally was able to move with full force into Korea in aims to push the Japanese back into the sea. The Chinese expeditionary force into Korea was under the command of a capable leader named Li Rusong. The Chinese army had initially set out with 43,000 troops, but were now bolstered by an additional 10,000 Koreans and an extra 5,000 Korean warrior monks. There are also some records that state the appearance of an additional 40,000 Jurchen troops present as well, but those appear to be largely unconfirmed. By February, Chinese and Korean forces were now drawing back up to Pyongyang. Konishi Yukinaga, at the head of only 15,000 troops, was fully aware of the unfavorable position he was in, and quickly sent out forward detachments to harass the advancing army. Yet, failing to halt them, eventually, once they had reached Pyongyang, Yukinaga would send word to the Chinese and Korean armies that he wished to open negotiations with them. They would refuse, and thus Yukinaga would in turn order another night raid of the enemy army, in hopes to break them before they even began a general siege of the city. Li Rusong, however, had anticipated such a move, and through the use of his forward scouts was able to flush out the Japanese raiding force, using arrow volleys to push them back. Before the inevitable assault of the city began, there would be a failed attempt by the Chinese and Koreans to assassinate Yukinaga by baiting him in with the actual prospect of conducting peace talks. Unfortunately, their plans were foiled. Following this, the Great Siege of Pyongyang began. If there is one thing the Chinese held over the Japanese other than numbers, it was superior artillery, as hundreds of Chinese cannons roared, crumbling walls and buildings all throughout the city. Soon Chinese and Korean troops began flooding in, as Tippo-wielding Ashigaru rained endless volleys down upon the assaulting soldiers. The orders given to the attacking troops were simple, no mercy was to be shown to the Japanese. All soldiers within the city or caught fleeing were to be cut down, other than Japanese commanders, who were, with any luck, to be taken alive. Yet still, the Japanese for a time held firm against the infinite waves of Chinese and Korean soldiers. It is even said that so many died trying to get over the walls, that their bodies piled up into mountains of dead men that almost created a ramp with which more attackers could climb up. Eventually, the Chinese and Koreans would finally, through sheer force of numbers, begin to break through. Thus, bitter fighting through the streets of the city began until at last, Yukinaga called for a full retreat. With winter having set in, his troops were able to make a desperate withdrawal across the now frozen Taedong River. The winter, of course, would have other severe side effects, as many of the retreating Japanese soldiers began to suffer from frostbite and fatigue. It was even said that many who were already wounded or dying from the cold were simply left behind. It was a sad march for Yukinaka's forces as he moved back to enter into the safety of Pongsan, a strategic position on the way to Seoul. Unfortunately, Otomo Yoshimune of the 3rd Division, who was supposed to be garrisoned at Pongsan, panicked when he heard of the incoming Chinese offensive. Believing that Yukinaga was likely killed and his forces crushed, Yoshimune opted to burn Pongsan to the ground and retreat to Seoul. Thus, when Yukinaga and the remainder of his beleaguered troops entered Pongsan, they sadly found nothing there with which to use for supplies or with which to take shelter from the cold. Instead, their march was forced to continue further south. This action by Otomo Yoshimune is largely one that has been continually judged as sheer cowardice bringing great shame upon him and disgracing the name of the Otomo family for the rest of its existence. 
But on the reverse side, things would not go entirely smooth for the Chinese and Korean reclamation campaign either. Although they were able to win a great victory against the Japanese at Hengju, holding off waves of Japanese forces led by significant samurai commanders such as Ukita Hideye, Ishida Mitsunari, and Kobayakawa Takakage. Chinese and Korean forces would also suffer a decisive defeat to the Japanese at the Battle of Pyeongchaeguan, which is often regarded to be one of the largest land engagements of the entire war. It was here Li Rusong, overconfident, charged hastily into a battle against a numerically superior Japanese detachment that was acting as a rearguard. The larger number of the Japanese managed to completely overwhelm the Chinese army and even nearly succeed in killing Li Rusong himself. Following this battle, it is said that Li Rusong no longer underestimated the Japanese, and had come to fully appreciate the prowess of Japanese superior matchlock gunners and skilled samurai warriors who all worked together to completely shatter the mighty Chinese cavalry. From this point on, the Chinese army began to adopt a more careful approach to their campaign, not wishing to suffer another defeat like at Pyeongchaeguan. Finally, after a steady advance of the main Chinese army, Seoul would be threatened. Konishi Yukinaga still wished to enter into negotiations with the Chinese and Koreans, and he was not alone in this mindset. Several other battle-weary samurai leaders also shared in the opinion that the Japanese position was a hopeless one and peace talks needed to commence. One such figure that supported the idea of negotiations was Ishida Mitsunari, a samurai leader who was not remembered for being a skilled general or warrior, but rather an administrator and favorite of Hideyoshi, who now found himself on the front lines of the war in Korea. These commanders wishing to sue for peace were quickly met with pushback from other samurai figures who would not dare give up, and wished to continue to fight on, perhaps even until death. Paramount of these more hawkish figures was none other than Kato Kiyomasa, a samurai who was known to have almost an aura of militarism. Eventually, after the food stores of Seoul were raided and destroyed, the Japanese were once again given no other option than to abandon the city and fall back. Korea had retaken its capital. Following this, being forced further back south, a little over a year since the war had begun, Japan would win one of their final victories of the first invasion, when they finally were able to seize Jinju, a long defended fortress in southern Korea. After which, they would go on to once again massacre nearly the entire surviving population within. But even then, the seizure of Jinju was mostly meant as a symbolic, brutal last act of defiance by the Japanese. As in actuality, they were soon forced to leave it behind as well, as most of their armies made their way back to the port of Pusan, under threat of a new, powerful Chinese offensive. Around Pusan, Japan had established a strong defensible position at which they could entrench themselves, using a series of coastal fortresses known as Wajo, a mighty defensive network that even the Chinese and Koreans dreaded to assault, knowing it would result in the further deaths of thousands. So it would be here, where the war initially began, where the first portion of the Imjin War would also come to its climactic end. Toyotomi Hideyoshi's initial invasion of Korea had failed, but surprisingly enough, this was not entirely viewed as a total defeat, at least not yet. Although Hideyoshi would have been in nothing short of an utter state of shock and despair following the complete turning of fate that caused Japan to go from nearly crossing fully over into China to now just holding a small portion of territory carved out along the southern shore. When all was said and done, there was still something he believed he could gain. Japan still held Korean soil, and a strong position with which later campaigns could be conducted out of. Although China had eventually intervened, Hideyoshi's armies had crushed the Korean land military and nearly succeeded in claiming the entire peninsula. Peace talks were to come, and in his mind he had won more than enough with which to barter for his new claims. So. What can we learn so far? After Konishi Yukinaga's seizure of Pyongyang and Kato Kiyomasa's push into the far northeast, the Korean peninsula was all but conquered by the Japanese, yet still, through Korean guerrilla warfare and victories at sea, the Japanese grip on land was a weak one. 
This would all come to a head when in early 1593, Ming China would finally be able to intervene, sending a massive army over the border to help the Joseon king retake his country. The Japanese, with a lack of incoming supplies and fresh troops, were simply unable to hold back the endless tide of Chinese forces, and soon would be forced back all the way to where they had initially landed in Busan. It would be here that the first portion of the Japanese invasions of Korea would come to an end, as peace talks would eventually commence. In the next episode, negotiations begin, as Hideyoshi argues for his claims, while many samurai who had fought in the war return home, with new mixed feelings for the man who had sent them into a losing conflict. Thank you for watching, and don't forget to like, subscribe, and ring that notification bell if you enjoyed this video and found it to be most informative.